Hello and welcome back to this course on critical learning on forest and adivasi rights. In this course, we are going to understand the Forest Rights Act 2006, also known as the FRA, using the lens of constitutional law. Our constitution lays down the fundamental rights of the citizens and the duties of the state towards its citizens. Apart from that, it lays down an entire mechanism for running this constitutional democracy. In this lecture, we will only focus on the fundamental rights in relation to the Adivasis. We will explore the connection between fundamental rights and the special protections provided for the Adivasis in Article 244 and 5th Schedule of the Constitution. The Constitution of India guarantees fundamental rights. These are considered to be basic rights which cannot be taken away from any person or citizen of the country under any circumstances. These rights are enforceable in a court of law and any person can approach the Supreme Court or High Courts for restoring these rights. Filing a writ petition in the Supreme Court of India for the enforcement of fundamental rights is recognized as a fundamental right in itself. Now, we will discuss the core fundamental rights in detail. The right to equality, fundamental freedoms and the right to life. Firstly, the right to equality is among the basic rights of our constitutional democracy. Article 14 of the Constitution of India gives equality to all persons. It means that the law will treat all persons equally. Similarly, Article 15 places a duty on the state to not discriminate against any citizen based on their identity, including religion, race, caste, sex, and place of birth. Both Article 14 and 15 place positive and negative duties on the state to ensure the right to equality to all citizens of India. But in reality, India has always been an unequal country. The socio-economic and political circumstances of various social groups are determined by their place in a caste-based society. Our society has been segregated on caste, class, religious and gendered lines. There is discrimination and oppression along these lines. Caste is the basis of social organization among Hindus. Hindus are divided among various Varnas and castes. They are assigned a social status and opportunities based on their belonging to a certain caste. For example, in a caste-based society, the Brahmin has the role of seeking and imparting knowledge. Kshatriya is recognized as the warrior class, Vaishyas are the trading class and Shudras are expected to serve the other three Varnas. Dalit and Adivasi people fall outside the scope of the Varna system. They were and are the biggest casualty of the caste-based society in pre-colonial, colonial and contemporary India. Dalits and Adivasis are victims of structural and systematic caste-based violence by the society as well as the state. Caste Hindus practice untouchability against them even today. But the history of the oppressed communities should not be mistaken as submissive or compliant. In this history of defiance against caste-based discrimination, Mahar Satyagra finds a unique place for itself. On March 20, 1927, Ambedkar, along with other Dalit leaders and members of the Dalit community, marched to the Kavdar tank in Mahar. They drank water from a public pond. Dalits were not allowed to use the public sources of water because the caste Hindus believed that they will contaminate water. The upper caste community unleashed violence against the Dalits after the Satyagra and conducted purification rituals at the tank. It is only one chapter in the history of anti-caste struggle during the colonial time, but an important one. First, because it makes the point that public places and resources should be open to all to access and to use. Second, the members of the Dalit community and their leaders chose Satyagraha as the medium of expression of their equal right over public resources. 
History tells us that the marginalized social groups like the Dalits and Adivasis have time and again risen against the unjust social structures. Even before our constitution was debated and written, the oppressed classes of our society had provided us a roadmap to understand substantive equality. Our constitution makers were also cognizant of such deep socio-economic and political inequalities. Therefore, they laid down special protections for the historically oppressed and vulnerable tribes, caste and classes. After the constitution was adopted, untouchability was abolished under Article 17. To enforce Article 17 of the constitution, the Protection of Civil Rights Act 1955 was enacted. It prohibits untouchability and makes all practices of untouchability a criminal offence. The example of Mahar Satyagraha and the abolition of untouchability in independent India shows us that law becomes an important tool to achieve the right to equality. Secondly, our fundamental freedoms are enshrined in Article 19.1 of the Constitution of India. It gives all citizens the right to freedom of speech and expression, to assemble peacefully, to form associations or unions, to move freely throughout the territory of India, to reside and settle in any part of India, to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation, trade or business. The state can also put some reasonable restrictions on these fundamental freedoms by making law. But it is important to recognize here that fundamental freedoms can be instrumental in ensuring the right to equality to all citizens. For example, the forest department started evicting the forest dwellers throughout the country in the year 2002. They were treated as encroachers rather than right holders. The tribal rights organizations organized protests all over the country. One of the demands of the movement was the enactment of a law which recognizes their right in forest. Due to the pressure exerted by the movement, the government was forced to debate and pass a law which is now popularly known as the Forest Rights Act 2006. This will be discussed in detail in part 2 of the course. Because of the constant protest and dharnas, the tribal rights movement was able to generate a public discourse for the recognition of the rights of Adivasis and forest dwellers who have been historically wronged by the state. The freedom of speech and expression then becomes an important tool to realize the right to equality. The tribal rights movement successfully organized the campaign for demanding the recognition of the rights of Adivasis and forest dwellers. The right to freedom of speech and expression was used to demand substantive equality from the state, just like the right to equality and the fundamental freedoms are seamlessly connected. The right to life with dignity will remain unrealized without ensuring equality and freedom. The right to life is much more than mere act of surviving. It means that people should be able to realize their full potential and live a healthy and fulfilling life. The interpretation of the right to life by the constitutional courts in India has been very broad. The courts have interpreted the right to food, the right to education and the right to a healthy environment as included within the right to life. Therefore, the right to education for children between the ages of 6 and 14 years have been recognized as a fundamental right and been added as Article 21A in the Fundamental Rights Chapter. In the Adivasi context, the autonomy of the Gram Sabha over land, forest and forest resources are essential to ensure their right to life and their overall well-being. In the Niyamgiri judgment, the Supreme Court observed that the Dungariya Kons and Kutiya Kons have a right to worship and protect their deity, the Niyam Raja. Niyam Rajas are the hills of Niyamgiri where these tribal communities reside and depend upon for their livelihood.
their rights are protected under Article 25 and 26. The court observed that the Gram Sabha has the power to safeguard the customary and religious rights of the Adivasis and other traditional forest dwellers under FRA. The Supreme Court understood the interconnection of cultural rights with the right to self-governance over forest and land. In the Adivasi context, the cultural rights of the Adivasis and their right to self-governance are correlated with their right to life and right to equality. Forest and land are essential to their identity and culture as a social group. It is also their only means of living well. Apart from these core fundamental rights, the constitution also lays down certain principles of the criminal justice system. We will not discuss them here because those principles will be dealt with in a subsequent lecture. The discussion about various fundamental rights in this part of the lecture shows us that the fundamental rights are interlinked. They should not be seen as individual and separate rights. Instead, the fundamental rights form a body of rights. The discussion on rights does not end with a discussion on fundamental rights. This discussion will be incomplete without making the linkages of fundamental rights with the directive principle of state policy or the DPSP. The DPSP are listed in part 4 of the Constitution of India. These are the directives given to the state for forming its policies on various social and economic matters. A simple understanding of DPSP leads us to think that it is not enforceable in the court of law. But jurisprudence emerging from the Supreme Court suggests that DPSP should be read together with the fundamental rights. Through such interpretations, the DPSP has been absorbed in the fundamental rights. So, fundamental rights and DPSP are inseparable. For example, the right to life with personal dignity for workers is very much dependent on the working conditions at their workplace. This right cannot be effectively guaranteed unless the state makes provision for secure and humane conditions of work, living wages, and decent standards of living. The responsibility of the state is described in Articles 41, 42, and 43. But we are aware that often the Adivasi youth and children from the fifth schedule and tribal areas are trafficked. They are sent to the cities to work in homes as domestic help and in hazardous industries as informal labor without any social security. There is a direct connection between the loss of land and the trafficking of Adivasis. If the state is unwilling to prevent the alienation of tribal land due to mining and development activities, then the state also abdicates its responsibility towards providing decent standards of living to the Adivasis. Similarly, the Supreme Court has also laid down that the right to life includes the right to a healthy and safe environment. Mining activities are undertaken in the tribal or fifth schedule areas like Sundagar district of Odisha. They lead to heavy air, water and land pollution in the surrounding areas. It may lead to a severe health and livelihood crisis for the Adivasi communities living nearby. Environmental degradation can lead to a violation of the right to life as well. Therefore, the state cannot forego its duties towards the protection of the environment and the life of its citizens. Until now, we have tried to comprehend fundamental rights and their interconnections with the DPSP. In the next part of the lecture, we will focus on the rights guaranteed specifically to the Adivasis under the Constitution of India and their connection to the fundamental rights. Fundamental rights have been guaranteed to all citizens of India, but to ensure those fundamental rights to the Adivasis, special protections are needed. Adivasi communities in particular are dependent on forest 
and land for a dignified survival. Previous lectures inform us that they have been driven away by the British colonist and the Indian state as well from their own land. Various reasons for the loss of land include mining and other development activities. The Adivasis have faced material and cultural alienation because they had no right to self-governance and control over land and forest resources. Therefore, the constitution recognizes the need for special administrative arrangement for the scheduled areas where the majority of the population belong to the scheduled tribes. The scheduled areas were created in order to preserve the tribal autonomy and culture. It is aimed at ensuring their economic empowerment to ensure social, economic and political justice. In the context of the rights of Adivasis, substantive equality can be guaranteed only when the right to equality and right to life are read along with Article 244 and 5th Schedule of the Constitution. According to Article 244, the scheduled areas and the scheduled tribes should be administered as per the provisions of 5th Schedule. There are 12 schedules in the Constitution of India dealing with specific issues. The 5th Schedule deals with the governance of scheduled areas and scheduled tribes. Scheduled areas are declared by a presidential order under Para 6 of the 5th Schedule. Under the scheme of the 5th Schedule, the governor has enormous powers to administer these territories. The governor can restrict and modify laws made by the central and state legislature in the scheduled areas. He or she can pass a new regulation for peace and good governance in the scheduled areas. The governor also has powers to make laws which prohibit or restrict the transfer of land from the scheduled tribes to non-tribals in the scheduled areas. He or she can make laws to regulate the allotment of land to the scheduled tribes. The governor can also restrict the practice of money lending to scheduled tribes in scheduled areas. While making these decisions, the governor should take the advice of the Tribal Advisory Council or the TAC. The TAC is formed to advise the governor whenever the advice is sought for welfare and advancement of the scheduled tribes. Even though TACs are an important institutional support, they are rarely functional and seldom instrumentalized by the governors. So, Article 244 and 5th Schedule makes a case for different governance structures in scheduled areas. But they do not specify what it should look like. In the rural areas, local self-governance is run by setting up Gram Sabhas and panchayats. Similarly, in the urban areas, the municipal bodies are formed as institutions of local self-governance. Local self-governance was recognized in the Constitution of India by the 73rd and 74th Amendment to the Constitution. Through these constitutional amendments, Chapters 9 and 9a were added in the Constitution. These deal with the formation of panchayats and municipal bodies. But Article 243M and 243ZC state that the provisions relating to the panchayats and municipalities will not be applicable in the scheduled areas. Therefore, to extend and recognize the structures of local self-governance in the scheduled areas, the parliament enacted the Panchayats Extension to Scheduled Areas Act 1996 or TESA. TESA extends the Panchayati Raj institutional framework to the scheduled areas. It extends the provisions related to Panchayats enumerated in Part 9 of the Constitution. But these provisions are extended subject to the list of exceptions and modifications prescribed in Section 4 of TESA. 
one of the most important conditions of extending panchayati raj laws to scheduled areas is that it should be in consonance with the customary law social and religious practices and traditional management practices for community resources most importantly pesa puts the gram sabha at the center of the governance mechanism in the scheduled areas because it has been the historical demand of the adivasi community we will learn more about this in the next lecture the right to self governance and control of the gram sabha over land forest and community resources are vital to ensure the right to dignified life the right to livelihood the right to food and fundamental freedoms for the adivasi community it is also essential to guarantee them political mobility so that they can represent themselves they should be able to make independent decisions for their well-being and governance of their community and resources therefore article 244 fifth schedule and pesa are essential for the realization of substantive equality to the adivasis in fact the fifth schedule was famously called a constitution within the constitution by the late dr b d sharma who was the former commissioner for scheduled caste and scheduled tribes in this lecture we learned that the fundamental rights the directive principles of the state policy and other provisions relating to the administration of scheduled areas in the constitution of india should be read together to guarantee the basic rights to the adivasis substantive equality and the right to life can be ensured to the adivasis through special legislation such as the pesa and the fra which gives them powers of self governance the tribal rights movement have engaged with our constitution to seek their constitutionally guaranteed rights this makes our constitution a living document we will learn more about pesa in the next lecture and fra in part 2 of the course thank you for watching